Hope another minute or two to finish logging on, then we'll actually start the webinar. Okay. Well, wel welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is part of our efforts at the National Research Center on Hispanic Children and Families to build capacity in the field to help better serve Latino communities through our country. With that, I'll go over a few logistics for the webinar. If you have any technical questions, please submit them using the Q&A box at the bottom of your panel. And you can easily submit questions to our team because we'll have some Q&A um, later on in the session. And uh, we'll want to make sure that we are able to get your questions. This is, um, we'll, we'll queue them up at the end, given the time to try and address as many of them as possible. Um, and if you are a social media guru, uh, feel free to follow us on NRC Hispanic for a discussion of the webinar and for the Hispanic Center in general. We have a number of speakers, so I'd like to take, take a moment and introduce them. First, myself. Uh, my name is Michael Lopez. I'm Vice President for Education and Child Development at NORC at the University of Chicago and also Co-Principal Investigator uh, for the Hispanic Center. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Next up is Nola Jatoy, a senior research methodologist at NORC at the University of Chicago. And Nola creates data and information visualizations to help researchers shed light on analytic findings. And we also have Ned English, a senior research methodologist at NORC, um, also in our Chicago office. And uh, Ned is responsible for the geographic information system capacity at, at, here at NORC, in addition to project management, sample design, analysis of, of numerous studies across disciplines. I mean, both are, are heavily involved in a lot of our data visualization work, and um, some folks may know are, are, are one of the best known efforts of the recent opioid interactive map tool that's, that's one of the highlights of the data visualization work. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge some of the critical behind the scenes team, you can't see them here with me, but Rebecca Berger, um, Ana Leon Santos, Karina Hoyer, and Katarina Yang, who made us all look good in doing a lot of background work. Um, now just a few words, quick words about the National Research Center on Hispanic Children and Families. Originally founded in 2013 through a grant from the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation within the Department of Health and Human Services. The center's mission is to conduct research and provide research-based information to inform programs and policies supporting low-income Hispanic families and children around three major areas, poverty and self-sufficiency, healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood, and early care and education. Because we aim to inform programs and policies, our research focuses on low-income Hispanics. In addition to our research work, we also fulfill our mission through capacity building activities to strengthen the capacity of the research field and expand the pipeline of scholars focused on Hispanic children and families. We do this through three main strands of work, providing resources to the field by developing a range of innovative resources, tools, and training activities with the Hispanic lens. Today's webinar, is an example of the type of capacity building efforts designed to maximize the use of existing data to more accurately reflect the experiences of Hispanic families across communities and different policy contexts. We also do work through supporting emerging scholars through a number of mentoring and networking activities. And then finally, engaging key stakeholders through a range of outreach and engagement efforts at conferences, newsletters, uh, among other efforts. The center represents a partnership of research and academic organizations, including Child Trends, NRC at the University of Chicago, uh, Duke University, Duke uh, Sanford School, and uh, University of Maryland, and University of North Carolina Greensboro, along with our federal partners, the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation in ACF. Just a quick note that the views expressed here represent those of the center and not the views of the federal government. Before I hand it off to my colleagues, Ned and Nola, I'd like to provide a little context about today's visualization training. 
I want to emphasize that today's presentation is primarily focused on highlighting different approaches and best practices related to data visualization and less so on the actual data. So tempting as it was for us to play with the data, um, it really is being ordered to uh, focusing on the techniques in order to demonstrate different comparisons. We built in some of these illustrative examples related to examining low income families in Chicago. And why Chicago? It's not just that Ned and Nola are in Chicago, but back in 2017, um, one, of the, one of the efforts of the Hispanic Center, <clears throat> we examined the rates of early care and education programs, uh, participation in early care and education programs for low income Hispanic versus non-Hispanic three and four year olds um, in Chicago. At the time, not only were, we, were our findings somewhat surprising, but they also raised additional questions about changes in the size and geographic distribution of the Hispanic families over time and how the ECE landscape has responded to these changes. So it prompted just as many questions as it answered. As you'll see from the examples, we use a combination for today, we use a combination of readily available data from the American Community Survey from the years 2012 to 2017, along with Chicago child care licensing data that we acquired thanks to a partnership with Illinois Action for Children. However, again, it's important to reiterate that while we include the storyline of low-income families with Chicago as an interesting backdrop, <clears throat> the main focus today is on the different data visualization techniques that can be used to tell different interesting stories with your data, depending on what your questions are. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Nola to dive right into the nuts and bolts of the data visualization training itself. Nola. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, we're just doing a transfer. Oh, good. Um, all right, so the goals of today's visualization training is just we're going to discuss the components of a good data visualization. And this is a good place to start. Um, it doesn't matter what your data is or what your story is. You always want to keep these components in mind. And we're just going to discuss what those are. And then we'll delve into a little bit of storytelling with data, the maps and mappable, mappable data, and then Q&A. All right, so what are the components of good data visualization? We have primarily three. Um, the purpose, the purpose of the, the graphic, the purpose of the visualization, and the story that we want to tell. That's um, first and foremost one of the places that we want to start at. The next part that we want to consider is, of course, the audience. So we're not going to do the same graphic for all different types of audience, and we need to think about that before creating a graphic. And then there are just some best practices that I'll discuss that can help us create more effective graphics. So first of all, the purpose. Oh. Uh, just give us a second, it seems to be stuck. We're having just a little bit of technical moving up. Oh, there we go. And of course, then the data is, for, is um, something that we always want to keep in mind when we're working on a graphic because that is the most important thing of a data visualization. All right, so a little bit more about the purpose. What is the data story? What is the story that we're trying to tell? And we always want to think about um, different kinds of stories. So regardless of what the data is that we're using, we want to think about are we comparing groups or are we looking at a distribution of the data across different groups or states or um, income groups? Are we looking at a composition or proportion to a whole? So um, what proportion of the, of the population is Hispanic? Or are we looking at some kind of change over time? So how does the data change over time? And we do have two data points here, 2012 and 2017. So how does the data change over time? So what is the data story that we're trying to tell? And then is it geographic? Do we have geographic uh, location data that we could put on a map to make, give a little bit more depth to our data? And of course, what does the data look like? Do we have all these components in the data that we can do these types of stories? And the data will help us determine what the story is. And the story will also help us determine what data we want to pull out. All right, and not to forget that uh, information is data as well. So a progress or a process can be a data flowchart. Timeline is also a kind of data information, uh, visualization, and of course, lists. So keeping in mind that information can also be the story. 
For the audience, the audience, we really need to picture these people in our mind. So who is the, the person that we're working towards that we want to get the message across? So we have policymakers, funders, community members, advocacy groups, just the general public or specific age groups, maybe teenagers or the elderly, or are we writing, uh, creating graphics and writing a data story for journalists. So each of these different audience types will require a different graphic and you will treat them differently in, in terms of what kind of information we want to share with them. And then um, to uh, steal this from a colleague of mine, Mark, what do we want the audience member to think, know, or do? So do we just want them to think about a specific topic? Do we want them to know something of importance? Or do we want them to do something, actually um, elicit some kind of action from them? So raise awareness for an issue or garner support. And this will vary depending on if we're speaking to policymakers or the general public. What do we want them to think, know, or do? And then importantly, why is this important to them? So we have this data and we're creating the graphic and we're doing all this work, but it has to be important to them. So how can we create the data and the data story that it really um, means something to them? What matters to them and how do they regard the issue and how will we shape the data story depending on uh, who the audience is? And then of course, how much do they need to know? So the general population probably doesn't need to know your standard errors. Um, whereas perhaps policymakers or other researchers would need to need a need to know more about the data or uh, the sample size and information like that. So how much of the data do they need to know? And then best practices. These are just some things to keep in mind as you're creating your graphics. First of all, the tools that you want to use. Um, there are many tools out there. We have Tableau, Excel, D3, R, and ArcGIS are just a few to uh, just to mention a few of them. And I know that. In the survey that participants took before this um, before the webinar, Excel was one that really um, was very popular, and R as well. Um, each tool has its pluses and its minuses, and so it's very important at the start of your data story to think about what is the best tool for the job. So Tableau is really uh, a great tool. It is very uh, easy to use. You drop and drag the variables and creates really good out of the box graphics. But it is expensive with licensing fees and it's very easy to make mistakes when you let Tableau do a lot of the driving for you instead of paying more attention to what the variables, how the variables are being read into Tableau. Excel um, has some really good graphics, um, but more complicated graphics can be difficult to create. But it is easy to access because everybody has it and it's easy to share Excel um, graphics but the defaults are really bad. So you really have to think about what you're creating and be a little bit more thoughtful and not let Excel create the graphics for you. D3 is an online library of JavaScript code. I really like D3. It creates some really cool interactive graphics that can also be shared static, um, but it is a programming language. So there's a little bit of a learning, steep learning curve with it, but it is free um, and you can go to the D3 library online and, and get a lot of code to create really cool graphics. R is also free. It is a programming language and it can create really cool uh, graphics, create interactive graphics, and you can pull in other um, platforms like R Shiny that you can make really cool dashboards and things like that with it. Um, but it is, again, a programming language. It's not uh, as familiar to a lot of people as Excel is and even Tableau. And then ArcGIS uh, is a, a geographic data mapping tool, which Ned will tell you more about in a minute. All right, so really figuring out what the tool is that you have at your disposal and what graphic you want to create is very important. And then keeping in mind that the data going into all of these tools is going to be different. So um, bear in mind what your data looks like. Accessibility is another best practice that we should always keep in mind when we're creating graphics. Um, things like 508 compliance, Americans with Disabilities Act. Being able to share your graphic with a lot of people is very important. So um, making sure that the font size is big enough. I recently worked on some graphics that was being shared for the AARP and one of the, that's for the elderly population. And one of the requirements was large font. So um, you're making sure that the audience can read what you've created. Uh, color blindness is also an important thing. Um, to, to remember, a lot of folks are colorblind 
Also, when you're printing in, in black and white, making sure that your graphics can be printed and still usable, even if it's printed in black and white. And then accessibility, uh, also in terms of where you're posting your graphics. Uh, a lot of graphics end up on paper, so it needs to just be a static graphic. Online graphics can be interactive. You can use HTML or JavaScript to create really interesting things. But obviously, those interactive graphics are not going to work in a paper report. Um, and then it, do your graphics work? If it's online, does it work in a mobile environment? And then last, uh, uh, another best practice is just to have some standards, um, things that you can like, create a checklist for yourself. So these are things that you know that um, bug you a lot. So for example, for me, I don't like decimal points unless they're really, really necessary. It can, really include, it can increase clutter in your, in your graphics. So just creating a checklist of are the axes tied, are there titles? Do you have a legend in your graphic? Have you checked for color blindness? Um, uh, some, there are some online tools to test if your graphic uh, passes a colorblind test. So just having a little checklist to remind you of these things that maybe sometimes over, over time we forget um, to include in our graphics. And then of course, how much information do we need to include to make the, to provide context for the graphic for the audience. And then of course, uh, doing a little QC quality check of your data, making sure that if you have a certain number of cases going in, you have those same number of cases coming out. And then feedback is always important, giving um, feedback on your graphics, on your data storage, your infographics, making sure that the data is clear, is the message clear, um, or have you thought about all possible perspectives of the way that the graphic can be interpreted. All right, so now moving on to storytelling with data. So we have some really interesting story, uh, interesting data. And one of the first places that I usually start with when I do a graphic is just the general um, number of cases, percentages. So just starting with a base level graphic, which is usually for me a bar chart, which so for here we're using ACS data, um, 2012 and 2017. This is just the general public and we want the purpose is to show how uh, the number of children in Chicago and compare by race and ethnicity. And this is just a bar chart created in Excel. So the percent of children in Chicago by race and ethnicity and we can see that about a third of um, children in the metro Chicago area are Hispanic. Now if we pull in um, some if we pull in the data for 2012, we can see that it hasn't changed that much. This is again just a bar chart and we're doing a comparison across race groups. Um, so this is interesting and we can kind of see, you know, that not much has changed, um, but a better way maybe to show this would be a slope chart also created in Excel. Again, we can compare across race groups, we can compare across time, and we can see that with the slope chart, there isn't actually much of a slope happening. So um, the numbers have not changed much over the past few years or comparing 2012 and 2017. So that's just a couple of low level graphics just to get the story going. And now I'm going to pass over to Ned for more details. Right. So from, hello everyone. So from a prior chart, you may think that there hasn't really been any change in race ethnicity in Metro Chicago over the past five years. But as policymakers or practitioners of research influencing Hispanic households with children, we might be interested in getting deeper into a more nuanced view. And to do that, I argue that we should take advantage of uh, maps and mappable data to look at how things have changed or stayed the same in Chicago over the past five years, which we use to be illustrative. So to take a, a step or two back, you know, everyone loves maps. They're more interesting to look at than piles of, piles of uh, tables, for example. The why we care about maps, we want to take advantage of spatial data. Um, the data that we have have some geographic quality to them or quantity to them, whether it's county or census tract or longitude and latitude, and we want to take advantage of that information that's extra or beyond the other attribute data that we have. So in social sciences, we don't have very many laws like there are in physical sciences that they made you learn about in undergraduate, but there is one, and that is Tobler's first law of geography, that all things are related, but near things are more related than far things. This is something that we implicitly, I think, understand as we consider social science quantities, that is poverty or educational attainment. Things change, but things change gradually. 
And also, there's lots of data out there. In fact, there's a fractal amount of data or infinite amount of data when it comes to geographic information. You can never capture every curve in a road or bend in a stream, for example. One needs to make selections when they capture or code geographic information. You can always add more decimal points, or sorry, digits to the right of the decimal point with the longitude and latitude. So this, that's enough cocktail party conversation probably. <laughs> but GIS, an acronym we hear a lot about, are the tools and techniques for the management and analysis of spatial data. So how do we take advantage of these geographic information? It's preoccupied with representing geographic data in a database. So how do we tell a computer where all these things are and how they relate to each other? Cartography, another vocabulary word you might have heard before, deals with the presentation of those spatial data. So how do we make effective maps to convey some information? I guess those two get blended together, but cartography is more concerned with presentation. But what's special about GIS? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it enables us to take advantage of these spatial relationships. The Latino households are clustered together in some way, differed from another category of households, or the distance from Latino households to the nearest childcare facility is, is distinct from another group. We need GIS to answer these kinds of questions. We, this is beyond what we have time to discuss today, but GIL also enables a spatial analysis or spatial statistics, the whole field of spatial statistics to understand spatial relationships related to distance or hot spots, cool spots, issues like this. Essentially, we'd like to add a third dimension to statistical problems that you couldn't really capture in your standard statistical software package like using SAS or SPSS conventionally, it's not possible to select all the households that geocode in a particular neighborhood, for example. That's beyond the scope um, because those data are not explicitly coded in the data set. They're really implicit information. One doesn't really need software to do GIS. I think our friend, I mean, maybe you've seen this map before of John Snell's cholera map. Here we have a geocoded pump layer, there are two pumps, one, they're both indicated by the uh, arrows here. One is near a cluster of cholera cases and one is not. So he's intersecting two layers together, that is geocoded address information, geocoded addresses that had at least one reported cholera case in order to pursue a policy goal, which in this case was to shut down a particular pump in London. This is before concerned with non-reusable plastic bottles, probably. But so this is GIS because we're intersecting more than one geographically coded layer together and considering a geographic quantity that is distance, I think. Now, there are many software packages for us to consider. Should we not want to do it this way? I mean, ArcGIS, I would say, is like the Microsoft of geographic information systems because it's everywhere and kind of expensive. It does most of what you want it to do. And however, there are many others. Um, ArcGIS is made by a company called ESRI, which stands for Environmental Systems Research Institute. And it was designed for that sort of thing. So if we want to model soil runoff from a pasture or conduct a in really more environmental analysis. And so there's another software package called MapInfo Professional that's more in the business space. However, um, we use both in our social science world, I would say. But then for geographic data processing, like if one were doing, say, analysis on high resolution raster data from satellite images, or wanted to pick out information in satellite images, there are or is a software package that's good for doing data processing. But there are many others. There are free software packages like QGIS or Geoda that have other options. So, but I think that when it comes to GIS software, ArcGIS is clearly the the market leader and can do nearly all of what you wanted to do. However, it's not the only software package. As we, if you start becoming a map critic, you'll notice there are lots of bad maps out in the world that might look pretty, but are not eff effectively conveying the information that they want to. For example, and this is not to criticize of Pandora, however, when you have categorical information, it's probably best to use color categories that permit the differentiation of them. 
it's a, but this is not a range. The top song in a given state is not a member of a range. It's a member of a category, for example. So I just, we could spend all day talking about ineffective maps. So perhaps instead, <laughs> instead I think we'll talk more about how to design effective maps to study the policy related to Latino households with children. Before we do that, I'd just like to describe some common applications of GIS and the social sciences. I think the most common is to look at data presentation through maps. Most often, what are known as coral cleft maps that I'll get to momentarily. So I'm showing a statistical surface, essentially. We also use GIS to create new data layers, link disparate data sets together, and so that addresses don't automatically know what census tract they're on until you link those two data sets together, for example. And then in order to discover patterns related to geography, density or dispersion. So coral plus maps are in the instance where we'd like to map a statistical surface. So we have a quantitative attribute, say the percentage of low-income Latino households with children or share of individuals in different race ethnic categories by area, like census tracts or counties or the unit in which they're reported at. So coral plus maps portray a statistical surface with area symbols, and the data coincide with the data collection regions. This is known as lattice data, like a fence lattice. We use coral plant maps because it doesn't make sense to report what's the median household income per square mile, because people are not arranged evenly across space, like temperature or environmental factors. However, we are stuck with the reporting units. This is a map of counties in the United States. I show this to emphasize how they're different sizes. In the eastern part of the United States, there are many more. And therefore, if one is looking at county level information, one has effectively a different resolution than, say, in Nevada, in the Mountain West, with larger counties. But we are dependent on them. We're kind of stuck with these units. Just very briefly, if there's a whole world of map design, but when considering designing maps, I would suggest we think about the size and shape of unit areas. Um, we'd like them to be about the same size and shape, the number of classes, and this is the same with making a bar graph or anything. The number of classes or categories we create can influence people's the interpretations they can make. As described by Mark Mominier in his fun book, How to Lie with Maps, which I recommend is a good beach read for any of you. Seriously, it's it's possible to take the same data, but change the categories to produce very different results. And just briefly, he uses the same data in only three categories to show that you can make Virginia look to be an outlier on one end or, or not. So it's very possible to influence the interpretation that people make from your data simply by making these decisions, design decisions. We'll start talking about maps that we created to illustrate policy decision making with respect to Latino households. But before we get to that, I just want to briefly describe best practices for creating multivariate maps. This is the case where we want to make show more than one variable at a time. Very briefly, there are a few major ways that we can do that. One would be to superimpose features onto each other that are transparent in some way, like using dots or different symbols that can be seen through. A second would be to create what are known as segmented symbols, such as a pie chart, so that the size of the pie might mean one thing, that is the median household income, and the individual pie sections can mean something else, say the race ethnic composition. However, as data users and social scientists, we know that pie charts are difficult to interpret. Like it's very difficult to know, do these slices mean 20%, 30%, 35%? However, one can, can see the relative composition, it's difficult to make real comparisons. So we tend to avoid segmented symbol maps. More commonly, and the examples we'll see momentarily, would be known as uh, cross-variable mapping. And you're familiar with these maps, say if you read the New York Times or Economist, where changing a color one direction means one thing, and changing a color or size another direction means another thing. Like this. This map shows, this is a census map, 
I show an example of the size of the circle means how large the or how important the most dominant foreign born group is. The hue, that is the name of the color, shows the country of origin for the most dominant group. But let's think about what we care about as policy related researchers when it comes to Latino households with children or Latinos in general. Let's say first we want to understand the distribution of children in the city of Chicago. We want to look at both the dominant race ethnicity, but as well as how diverse that area is. Here we use uh, the American Community Survey, which conveniently publishes census tract level data uh, throughout the United States. So here's, here's a map of the city of Chicago. The black outline is the city boundary, whereas the gray outlines show individual census tracts. Census tracts are the units in which the data are reported, about 2,000 households. I included an air, airplane icon to show where O'Hare Airport is. Many of us have probably spent time against our will there. And the arrow showing where downtown is, known as the loop, for reference. As you can see, the different colors here show the proportion of children in an individual race ethnic group. That is the hue or the name of the color shows what's the most dominant race ethnic group in a given tract. How, the, how saturated that color is shows how, how dominant it is. For example, a very dark green color would show that most children are white and that number probably approaches 90% say or 100% as it gets darker and darker green. And therefore the lighter values show a more diverse tract, that the most important race ethnic group isn't, perhaps isn't so. Areas such as on the northwest side of the city between the Loop and O'Hare, you can see are more diverse because you have purple tracks next to orange tracks next to green tracks, for example. And so I just show this as an example of using a multivariate coral plant map to show two variables concurrently. We can take a different approach to this as we consider we think consider policy or what's important for a Latino households or Latino child researchers. In this case, we use the American Community Survey again, but to look at poverty, this is the, on the left-hand panel, we look at single parent households, the most common race ethnicity of children in poverty. The right-hand panel, looks at non-single parent households, the most common race ethnicity for children in poverty. The thinking being perhaps the fact that a household has more than one parent will influence uh, support, et cetera, when it comes to households in poverty. The white tracks are too few children in poverty to report. Remember, this is a survey, the American Community Survey. Therefore, small numbers are suppressed. We can see there, is there a difference and that there's just more African-American households, single parent households with children in poverty than Latino households. And I circle in yellow a neighborhood on the west side of Chicago where you can see there's more of the orange African-American shades in the single parent left-hand panel, whereas more purple Latino shades in the non-single parent right-hand panel. So this is a bit more complicated because we have two maps here, each showing uh, more than one variable. In this case, the most dominant race ethnicity for children in poverty for single and non single parent households. I think policymakers or researchers could use maps like this to understand where particular programs might be useful in this space. We could also take advantage of animation, say, to see how things change over time. I think a difficult question is how have the data changed over time? In this case, it's where are the Hispanic households with children and how do they relate to uh, childcare facilities across the city, both home-based and center-based childcare facilities. So I'm gonna show an animation here. It starts in 2012, goes through 2013, 14, 15, and 16, and it's a little difficult to see in that space. But here I compare the first year, 2012, 
to the last year, 2017. And here it shows a proportion of children under five that are Hispanic in the coral cliff, that is. So the dark purple shades are, have mostly Hispanic children, the lighter shades don't. We can see that some tracks, especially those on the near northwest and the near southwest sides, have gone from a darker purple shade to a lighter or white shade. So these are losing Hispanic children. The geocoded dots show home-based care in, in blue and center-based care facilities in orange. The thinking being, have, or the question for us, our researchers, have the home-based or and center-based childcare facilities followed the movement of Hispanic households with children? Now, this may be a lagging indicator. It may take time for, even if a neighborhood is changing and losing Hispanic households as children, it might take time for the child care facilities to fill in. I think these maps also show that the more Hispanic census tracts tend to have more home-based child care than center-based care, which tend to be in more white, non-Hispanic parts of the city. But I also circle a neighborhood in the near southwest, known as the Pilsen neighborhood, that if you're interested in the housing or I should use the G word, the gentrification space has seen a, a rapid change. I zoom in to the Pilsen neighborhood and essentially what you see, the left-hand panel is percent of households with children that are Hispanic in 2012. The right hand is 2017. Just tracks that have gone from dark purple to white because um, Latino households with children um, have been moving uh, further south and further west. Now, it's still somewhat difficult to see the places that have changed. And so finally, we can create a map that focuses on the change itself. And here what we do is we categorize a census tract in 2012 based on what quintile was it with respect to Hispanic households with children. So it did have a low medium or high rate, rate or share of household, Hispanic houses with children in 2012 and subtract that from the same quintile in 2017. So essentially we want to highlight tracks, do they move up or down in that hierarchy across time? And this map, so here the blue tracks move down. So they went from having more Latino households with children in 2012 to having fewer in 2017. So though we're seeing a loss, the red tracks show a gain. They went from fewer to more. The number here is how many categories did they shift on those maps? Those maps had five categories. So the maximum you could move was down five or up five. So this, this map shows the difference between those two. And I think what it's showing is the blue tracks where in the city of Chicago, where we're losing Latino households with children tend to be a ring around the downtown area, especially convenient to transit, accessible for younger people, primarily areas that have seen increases in housing costs since the recession. Areas that have seen increases in Latino households with children tend to be more on the periphery with some exceptions. But generally speaking, I would break it down to further out to, to entering, entering. Why do we care about this? Well, I think uh, policymakers or researchers could use these data to really target their programs. So, for example, if you work with households with children or Latino households with children, it's, I think it's important to know where our target population is moving so that we can focus our programs in these places. In fact, perhaps to anticipate other places where might see changes or gains in Latino households with children. Now, I will give control back to Mike. Thanks, Ned um, and, and Nola. Um, that was great, and I think that we um, we were joking beforehand, I'm going to make Ned an honorary Hispanic Center um, researcher, um, since he's not only mastered his data visualization, but also has uh, done a great job with with the interpretation within the, the Hispanic Center framework. Um, we've had a number of questions that have come in. Please feel free to continue uh, submitting some questions, but we're going to um, open it up. And I think 
Ned and Nola, there are a number of questions that are on the technical end. Fortunately, we have a good amount of time because this was scratching the surface, the tip of the iceberg, and now we have an opportunity to dive into some of these issues that, that um, people have raised. Ned, um, I know, and Karina has, should have the questions. I see the first question was about uh, representing them um, about error or the essentially the American Community Survey is a survey. So they publish the amount of error that's around each estimate, which and that's a good question. How do we represent error on a map? That is, so if we think the median household income is fifty thousand dollars plus or minus five thousand dollars. We could do that using more than one variable, I suppose. Like we could, I'm just trying to think here because this is not usually done. Usually we foolishly take the ACS for granted. Don't consider the amount of error unless we are doing a statistical comparison. We want to know if there is a statistically significant difference. But I suggest we could design a map that's similar to the bivariate core class we looked at earlier, perhaps. The, the saturation of the hue, how deep the color is, could indicate how confident we are. Or we could use another symbol, like an open circle, to represent how confident we are in that estimate or the margin of error. Oh, I'd like to jump in there and just say, um, like, I think you have to consider your audience and if they even want to um know this information so i think we have to do our due diligence and make sure that we're not using data that's not reliable but um thinking about our audiences do they really need to know these margins of error all right next one's yours what's uh software to use the uh, county national map there are several options here um, in fact we we used arcgis to create these maps but it's possible to use even non-GIS packages like Tableau to make simple county coral plant maps, but there are many different options, I think, depending. Now, if one wants to make fancier maps, these bivariate maps that we showed today, it would be necessary to use a package like ArcGIS. But just to add, I don't know if, um, it, well, with that, you can, if you're talking about shape files for like counties and tracks, yeah. and whatnot, you can go to, um, I think the Census Bureau has shape files uh, called Tiger shape files. Oh yeah, so that's to get to get the, the actual boundary data. That's right. I think she's asking about like okay. to create a map that shows some rate at those units. I'll take this question. Will you share the info on t information on tools that check for co color blindness um, and what to expect from the resource guide? So yes, we will. Um, we can definitely share the links to resources online that can check for color blindness. Um, and we will be creating a resource guide that we will share with um, attendees later on in the week and we will put all these uh, information about the different tools and um, different resources in that guide for you. Right. And related question about choosing colors. Some of it is a practice, but there's a good website called Color Brewer that lets you set up different color ramps essentially and provide suggestions. Um, so Color Brewer. You know, they, they don't work for us, but we endorse color brewer. <laughs> You'll also do the color blindness question. And I'm going down. Yeah, so there's a question about interactive data visualization and do they facilitate false relationships perhaps or I agree that there's a lot more interactive data visualization now due to proliferation of the internet and tools like JavaScript and D3 that make it possible to allow users to, to manipulate these tools. I don't necessarily have concerns about interactive data visualization, except that the instinct of those who create these tools is to put too much data in there. Like the user doesn't need 25 different variables to interact with concurrently. The beauty of the static data visualization they're designed to tell a specific story more, perhaps. And so I think there, there's value both in static and interactive data visualization. I think one good thing about interactive tools is that instead of needing to create a set of 25 different maps, 
one could have one tool to get to the same place. But question six? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, so, let's plug the opioid tool. Oh, yeah. Sure. So the, there's the questions about other mapping programs. So ArcGIS is, I would say, the most common or most popular GIS software package. However, it can be expensive for, for users, and it can do more than, what, more than what most people need, probably. And then it has a lot of functionality, but most people don't need all of it. There is a free version that, I'm, that some people use called QGIS for, that I, my understanding is can do a lot of what or can do for those who don't have a budget for it. Map Info Professional for a long time has been in the or business space with similar functionalities, ArcGIS. There's a great free software package called Geoda for exploratory data analysis. If you want to understand your data and make some maps and make some charts, and it's very easy to use, if you call Geoda, G-E-O-D-A, that that we use or I use in teaching short courses because it's so easy to pick up. They can do do a lot. All right, so the, another question is, could you talk a bit more about any best practices or strategies for displaying more complicated statistical models for non-research audiences? So I think um, here, I think there are a couple of things you can do is, is really picture the audience in your mind and think about um, if you, if they really need to know the statistical models, um, and, uh, and if if they don't, you know, maybe show it to a non-research uh, uh, audience person and ask them if the, the level of information that you're showing is too much or just about right. Another thing that you could do is um, like layer your information, maybe with a header that's more uh, informative for a non-research um, audience, and then layer the more the statistical modeling and that kind of information that you have, um, put that in, in more information, sort of like a footnote or something like that that you could have, or create graphics with annotation where you explain what the, the models are or um, what the graphics mean so that the, the non-research public can understand those graphics. Uh, question eight or nine. Uh, all right. Um, will you be talking about any other approaches or software for data visualization besides mapping examples? So yeah, we can present present more information um, on on different tools. Uh, we just briefly touched upon the the pros and cons of each of the tools, but we can include links with more information and some handouts. Um, to other tools that, that could be useful as well in the, in the resource that we'll send out later this week. Nolan, Ned, can I, um, can I kind of build on that? Because I, I think as we were talking about some of the different options and the range of options, Nolan, you did a nice job of, of talking about some of the different factors. But when you, when, you think, when you think about what is the question that I am trying to ask and answer, um, how does that help guide what approach to use, whether or not to use a, a, a spatial mapping or to use another type of data visualization? What's, when you think about that, how do you usually approach that? Because that's kind of, you, you threw a lot of stuff out there for me, and, and I, I think about what, how am I going to make a decision of, of R or ArcGIS or, or some of the others? And so maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Um. So I think it goes back to one of the first graphics I showed, which was, are you looking at comparison or distribution? So I think once you nail down what the relationship is that you want to show in the data, um, then when you pick a tool, that's what you feel most comfortable with. When I look around the room, I see people who use Excel, people who use um, R, D3, Tableau, um, just what you have access to and what you feel most comfortable with. Um, I personally move between between tools depending on what I have to do. So if I'm just doing something quick and dirty and I want to really explore with the data, Tableau is really good for that because you could just drop and drag um, across the user interface and create graphics. If I have to do something that's replicable that I'm going to create for a report that has to be produced every month, I'm going to use something that uses a programming language like R because then I could just change the variable name or point it to a different data set um, and that's going to be something that I can reproduce each month or each year or whatever um, if that has to happen. Um, 
I'm trying to think, uh, also the platform that it's going for, if I'm creating a static graphic, most likely going to work in Excel and Tableau um, because that's the easiest way to create static graphics. And if I'm going to create something interactive, I won't use those tools. I will use R or D3. If it's going online, I'm going to use D3 because it works really well with HTML and can be really flashy. Um, but if you want something really simple, uh, you know, you really have to, it, it's sort of, you start with exploration. What tool do you get to explore the data and better understand the data in? And for me, that's usually Tableau um, and starting to be more with R. Um, but if it's going to be something that I share with others, I'm going to work in Excel because then they can access it. So you really have to think about um, like your, the whole process of what you're doing and who so, you're working so, with. So then a follow-up question related to that. I'm, I'm new to all the data visualization, which is actually true. And I know, I know I, I have the benefit of being able to pick up the phone and call the two of you. But if I'm new and I'm trying to learn some of this, what would be, there's a lot of options. And yes, it depends on, you know, some of them I may be more comfortable with others. But if I had to pick two or three just to kind of put in my toolbox, which would be the two or three, not, this is not a, intended to be a commercial, but what would be the two or three that you think would provide enough versatility as a, as a newbie? as a newbie um i i would if i could go back five years to before i knew all these programming tools i would invest my time and energy in r and d3 um, because i think that's the way that the world is moving i know that we focus a lot on tableau and i think tableau is very useful for people who want to create the one-off graphics i think if you if you're going to work in data visualization every day all day i think you should focus your energy in r or, or d3 and or d3 um, if you're going to just want to create a good graphic for the odd report, then I would learn Tableau. Because Tableau's graphics are really good, the defaults are really good, you can create a really good graphic just within a couple of minutes um, without doing a lot of work. Whereas with, uh, if you're going to be doing this every day, the investment in learning R, uh, I, I, I really wish I could go back in time and, and learn that um, three or four years ago. Does that help? That's great. Well, and, as, and go ahead. Sorry. So, but but if I was at an organization, I would, and I knew a lot of people were creating graphics, I would promote Tableau. Um, I know it costs a lot of money, but the default out of the box graphics are just so much better than Excel, and it's so much easier for people to create really really good graphics for the folks who don't do it every day. And then I know that I know that um, Ned, actually both you and Noah do a lot of data visualization um, courses or, or presentations at, at different universities. I, and I've heard that more and more people are embracing this, not only kind of students and emerging scholars, but also those in the program practitioner world that are realizing, hey, we need better ways to, to um, help harness and display our data in visually appealing ways. So how is it that uh, people who are, may not necessarily want to do it themselves, but who, like I might be working at a state child care agency or, or you know, a, another organization, how, how do I best go about finding resources if I'm not going to do it myself, but how do I find ways to be, you know, get some data visualization BFFs um, so that I can utilize that, these approaches? <laughs> contact us. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think resources. there are a lot of online resources. Um, there are a lot. On a, there are a lot of online resources. So, for example, Tableau. There's public Tableau, which is free. There are online resources that you can use um, that, that that can help you create it with the tool. But in terms of the people, there are people who just see the world better in graphics than they do with tables and charts, well, with tables and, and just lots of data. And I think find those people who, who see the world in bar charts and, and work with them because um, I didn't know that I wanted to do this. And I think there are lots of people out there who really would enjoy it if given the opportunity. So find them and invest in them. That's... Questions here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, data 
is security. Yeah, the, the question about yes. data security, yeah, that's always an issue. So the data we showed were mostly from the American Community Survey that's already been really, they've done disclosure review. So it's not possible to identify individual households on the American Community Survey data. However, for your, any other data set, that's not the case. So I agree that one needs to be careful in showing the geographic location of individuals or individual households that that is acceptable. Um, so I think, yeah, data security is always something to keep in mind. You wouldn't want to show individual households. We showed location of businesses that are in the public domain, the childcare businesses, that's different. But we did not show the location of individual households. We showed rates at an area level that are designed to uh, not reveal an individual household. So, um, there's so, so, uh, Ned, no, there's so when is when is too much? When is data visualization too much? Because there's one question that I really liked that where where more and more people are embracing data visualization as 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 an approach to really try and make your data more lively and sexy in in its presentation. But and I think Nola, you mentioned this. You know, if you have a printed report. You're not going to be able to do the interactive kind of the cool over time, like the opioid mapping tool. Um, when is it too much? Because as we're rushing to more and more sophisticated approaches for data visualization, when do you have to kind of scale it back and say, okay, maybe a bar chart is fine, maybe a a more traditional approach is fine? How do you strike that balance? You think of the purpose, and if, if you, you, you're very clear about the purpose and the story you're trying to tell, you write down your research question, and if your graphic doesn't answer your research question, you're going to take a step back. Um, so uh, another thing with, with making things sexy and fancy and all these bells and whistles is if you take all those bells and whistles away, does the graphic still work? Then you probably don't need all the bells and whistles. Um, but the bells and whistles also get you attention. So if you're trying to draw in attention for a specific issue, people like shiny things. So, you know, make things shiny and then you get their attention and then you keep their attention with a good data graphic. So it, it is a balance. Um, I think having a lot of people around the table, so having the, the people around the table that want the shiny, flashy, sexy things uh, right next to the people who want things more, um, focused on the data and on a clear research question, having those people all around the same table and getting their feedback um, makes for a better overall um, graphic and, and that way it keeps everybody in line. Great. Well, th thanks, um, Ned and Nola. I, we are just about out of time. And thanks to all the participants. Um, can you do that? There you go. Um, we, thanks to our funders, ACF and OPRE. And um, you have our contact information. We will be sending out to participants, we'll be sending out a follow-up with a link for the webinar. We'll be archiving it on the Hispanic Center um, website. And we're putting together a set of resources on some of these different tools. So thanks everyone for participating and we look forward to, we have another webinar coming up on September 26th for emerging scholars looking at career exploration options. So join us then and uh, follow the center for additional information. Thank you.